Witnesses to a raised redeemer. Witnesses to a raised redeemer is what we're looking at tonight. We're right in the midst, of course, of the resurrection narrative of John. Let me just give you a little bit of, of review from last week so we pick right up. Left off at the 11th verses, which is where we're starting tonight. <clears throat> we established the fact that the ladies who had come uh, with uh, Jesus, uh, uh, rather I should say from Galilee and that whole region, as they followed him, they provided for him and the disciples out of their own means, that these women were there at the cross as Jesus was, was giving up his life in propitiation substitution for all who would believe, for all of the elect. And they followed Joseph of Arimathea to the grotto, into that garden where his grave was, where that tomb was. They knew exactly where it was, and there was more than three of these gals. Three at least are named, and of course they're named in Mark's gospel in the 16th chapter, Mary Magdalene being one of them. And we found out as, as uh, verse 1 starts talking about in the 20th chapter, that on the Meonton Sabbaton, the first of all the Sabbaths to come when Jesus was raised, Mary Magdalene came to the tomb early. Early. Um, if you look back just so you have a reference and you look at the 16th chapter of Mark, for instance, 16th chapter of Mark starting in verse 1, it says when the Sabbath was passed, and that would be the Saturday Sabbath that they were resting on because Jesus was crucified on the preparation day, which is a Friday, and uh, we've already seen the passages that speak about the fact that the preparation day was preparation not only for the Sabbath every week, every Friday, but that this Sabbath was a high Sabbath because what holiday fell on that Sabbath? Exactly. Thank you. Passover fell on that that year. So when the Saturday Sabbath was passed, here comes the names, Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James, and Salome brought spices so they might go and anoint him very early on the first of the Sabbaths. Now, from there, slip over, just so you have a, a good feel for it, slip over to the 24th chapter of Luke, 24th chapter, and you look at the first verse. 24 of Luke, first verse, but on the first of the Sabbaths, not the first day of the week, the word day isn't even in the Greek text, but on the Meonton Sabbaton, at early dawn, they went to the tomb. Who is the they? Well, verse 55 of the previous chapter, verse 55, says the women who had come with him from Galilee followed and saw the tomb and how his body was laid. So they actually looked inside of the tomb of Joseph of Arimathea. They saw how his body was laid out. They knew which tomb it was. If one of them forgot, you had two others at least, and there were actually more than just the three women, but there were, there were others as well. They saw where he was. They didn't go to the wrong tomb. Then it says in 56, they returned and prepared spices and ointments on the Sabbath, which was this next Saturday, the next day, they rested according to the commandment. So that's the fourth commandment in particular. So on the first verse of the 24th chapter, on the first day of the Sabbaths, at early dawn, they went to the tomb, taking the spices they had prepared. So these are all these women that came out of Galilee. All right, slip back to John 20 now. Mary Magdalene is named as part of that. Now John focuses in on Mary being the one that... A, comes with the other women. She sees that the stone is rolled away, and they were coming up to, to the tomb saying, well, who's going to roll the stone away for us? You know, they weren't really thinking. All they knew is they wanted to do a good honoring thing for their beloved master. They were not thinking in terms of he's raised, he's raised. They were thinking his body was still there, see, even though consistently, especially in Matthew's gospel, there's at least three occasions where Jesus says to the twelve, the Son of Man is going to be taken, betrayed into the hands of the Jewish high priests, into the hands of Rome. They're going to beat him. They're going to torture him. He's going to be whipped. He's going to be crucified. But on the third day, he will rise. So we have that all established right there. But these women just went through this multitude of anguish, and the anguish was still fresh. Mary Magdalene comes to the tomb early, John chapter 20 and verse 1, saw that the stone had been taken away from the so she ran and went to Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one whom Jesus loved. We already established last week that that is John beyond a, beyond a doubt. 
and said to them, They have taken the Lord out of the tomb, and we do not know where they have laid him. Peter went out with the other disciple, John, and they were going towards the tomb. Both of them were running together, but the other disciple outran Peter, reached the tomb first, and stooping to look in, he saw the linen cloths lying there, but did not go in. We looked at the Greek right there, and we established that this was like a cocoon type of scenario that was going on, like a chrysalis, a butterfly that a butterfly would emerge from. And amazing, because this would have been, of course, the strips of linen that um, Joseph of Arimathea and then Nicodemus, who had brought the gummy resin, maybe 65 to 75 pounds worth uh, of this stuff, and they would fit it in between, uh, push it in between the strips, and it would harden and turn into this. Well, Jesus' body just vanished right out of it. You know, he didn't have to tear through anything like that. This is the resurrection. This is the glorified body of Christ Jesus. And you and I will have similar bodies, individual, perfect, and glorified like Christ. And yet our bodies, according to 2 Corinthians 5, talks about the fact that those bodies are waiting for us in heaven and our spirits will inhabit those bodies. Fantastic. And so they see this and it's amazing to them. <laughs> I mean, put yourself in Peter and John's position. What the heck are we looking at right here, right? Amazing. Like well, this is, and I mean, they've got to be a little scared too. This is out of the normal, out of the norm. Uh, verse 6, then Simon Peter came following him, went into the tomb, and he saw the linen cloths lying, same, same idea, and the face cloths which had been on Jesus' head, not lying or not standing with the linen cloths, but folded up or better rolled up in a place by itself. Then the other disciple who reached the tomb first, that's John, also went in, he saw and believed. Faith came quickly to John. And this is John, of course, that stuck with Christ from uh, the Garden of Gethsemane where the arrest took place, right? The arrest takes place. John and Peter follow at a distance. They go to Annas' house first. He gets into the courtyard, right? Gets into the courtyard because they know him. There's some sort of a, of a relationship there. We're not told exactly what it, does, what it was. And then John gets Peter in right there. And, of course, this is the place where Peter falls apart. And uh, But John is staying there. John is there at the crucifixion. He is there on Golgotha. He is with Mother Mary right there. Jesus, so the final things to do, of course, is to see that his mother is taken care of. All of this is going on. John it receives Jesus' mother and, as far as we know, um, uh, provides for her for the rest uh, of her days. And so he saw and believed, for as yet, verse 9, they did not understand the scripture that he must rise from the dead. And we went through those old covenant scriptures starting with Psalm 16, verse 10, and others uh, that he must rise from the dead. Then the disciples went back to their homes, which brings us then uh, to the text for tonight. Text is a little bit long, but we're going to treat it like a narrative going from verse 11 all the way through 23. Witnesses to a raised redeemer. We will first consider the witness of the angelic and a woman because these angels are going to appear to Mary. And Mary, of course, is this woman. Secondly, the witness of the raised Lord. Mary is going to encounter Christ right there. She will be the first one to see the Lord Jesus, the raised Lord Jesus, which is a big, big deal. You know, Jesus doesn't appear to Caiaphas. He doesn't appear to Annas, the high priest pro tem. He doesn't appear to Pilate. He doesn't appear to Herod. He doesn't go, you know, you guys blew it and here I am. You thought you could kill me. Ah, that doesn't take place in any way, shape, or form. Rather, he goes to a woman first who will be his primary witness. And, of course, in that culture, they did not take the word of a woman as having any kind of foundation at all. That's just the way it was back then. And, in fact, in Luke's gospel, it even talks about the fact that when Mary starts telling Telling the apostles about this. They just treated her like she was out of her nut or something like that. They weren't buying it. They weren't looking for a resurrection. The text here in, in chapter 20 and verse uh, 9 says they didn't understand the scripture that he would be raised from the dead. But let's read, let's read the text in sections because it's a little bit long. The, the third point will have to do with the witnesses of the ten and a special receiving. This is where Jesus appears to the ten that night in the upper room 
The doors are closed. They're, they're closed and locked for fear of the Jews. And so Jesus appears to them. One of the things he's going to do, he's going to breathe on him and he's going to say, receive the Holy Spirit. It's for a very specific purpose. It is separate from, separate from what will happen in almost less than 40 days at that point when the day of Pentecost occurs and the Holy Spirit falls. That's another separate teaching for another time. But then this one right here is very specific to these men, to what is known as the 12 in particular. So let's consider the first point, the witness of the angelic and a woman from verses 11 through 13. Let's read that much. But Mary stood weeping outside the tomb. And as she wept, she stooped to look into the tomb. And she saw two angels in white sitting where the body of Jesus had lain, one at the head and one at the feet. And they said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? She said to them, They have taken away my Lord, and I do not know where they have laid him. So the witness of the angelic, they're presented right there. Mary is there also witnessing these things. Looking back at verse 11, <laughs> Mary stood weeping outside the tomb. I think this is very instructive because if you look back at verse 10, look back up one more verse, what do John and Peter do? Do they stay? Then the disciples, meaning Peter and John, went back to their homes. By the way, homes right there really isn't right. Oikos is the Greek word for, uh, for home. Uh, you pluralize it, and of course you get homes. But if the Greek actually is autus, it would be better if uh, it said they went back to their own. Now it does imply that possibly a place, a place where they were staying, they didn't have homes in Jerusalem. They probably went back to the upper room, probably, but it's a little bit of a guess. But they left, that's the thing. The disciples leave, but Mary stays. Mary continues to be where Jesus is. She wants to be as close to him, even in death she wants to be there with him. So Mary stood, she took her stand. Uh, she wasn't going to leave. She was not satisfied with what she had seen or understood at this point. The body of her king is gone. Once again, she's not expecting a resurrection, but this woman loves her master, see, and she is there. She wants to be close to him. Mary stands, but she doesn't just stand there in any kind of an attitude. She's not defiant. She's not speaking out against the Jews or the Roman government that perpetuated this heinous crime from a from a human perspective. Instead, she stands there weeping outside the tomb. She's standing outside. She is kleo in Greek for weeping. And we've got a present participle going on. She is continuously a static present. She is continuously weeping along here. Weeping because of what uh, the frustration and all that she is feeling. And as she wept, middle of verse 11, she stooped to look into the tomb. Now, the phrase she stooped gives us a little bit of an insight of the smallness of this tomb. Here's what I want you to understand. And you can go over there, you can see uh, pictures, you know, we have archaeological shots that have been taking place of the various types of tombs that are over there in the Jerusalem uh, area. What they would do when they would, when they would, <laughs> these things were, were hammered out of solid rock. Okay, this took a long time to deal with. So this is not some big affair. Uh, this is not some giant you, you crawl in through the hole and then it just sort of opens up into sort of like a cavernous sort of a thing. That is not what is going on here. You were pretty much stooped down. So you had to kind of get down on your hands and knees and crawl in. Can you imagine bringing a body in, you know, into a situation like that? It's very difficult. The dead weight of a human body, a man, and you're pretty much trying to not disrespect the body but at the same time, there's some dragging and some pushing that is going on. So they get the body in, and then they have to get it into, remember we talked to you about those, those slabs, those outcroppings where the body would be laid, and sometimes it would be one on top of another, not one body on top of another, but the slabs would be like shelving, you know, that, that kind of a thing. And the angels then are to be seen in there, but, but we, we, we sort of get to it a little bit uh, quick here. So she stooped to look into the tomb, verse 12, and she saw two angels in white sitting where the body of Jesus had lain. One of the things that really stands out to me right here is that once again, the angels are with Christ in the sense of 
They were with him and announced him from the beginning, right? You've got uh, Luke, the second chapter, and you've got the angel that appears before the shepherds. And then, of course, the angelic host bursts forward, and the shepherds are seeing all of this. And they're declaring uh, glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace among those men with whom he is pleased, is the way the Greek reads right there. And it's talking about those who are of, of the elect. And so they are there announcing. You've got the angels with Christ. Midway or at the beginning of his ministry when he's 30 and he uh, is baptized by John and then goes into the wilderness and is tempted by the devil or tested by the devil uh, for that period of time. And then after that's done, it says in Luke's, uh, Luke 4 that the angels came and ministered to him, you see. And then here at the very end, the angelic are, are there. They're attending. Uh, Jesus could have even stopped the entire matter. He says to the apostles, yeah, after, after Peter had drawn the sword in the garden, don't you think I could call on legions of angels and my father would send them? It'd be just like that and the whole thing would be, would be done. But he wasn't about to do something like that. But he's very close and they were very close to him. These angels, which are messengers, are that now to give the most important message the most important message concerning the ministry of Jesus in that he has been raised. Look at what it says. 12, and she saw these two angels in white sitting, I like that, where the body of Jesus had lain. Matthew's gospel in Matthew 28 has the angel, one angel in particular, coming down out of heaven and he just flicks that, that stone, that heavy millstone away and then just takes a seat on it. Jesus is gone. It's not to let Jesus out. It's so that people are invited to come in and bear witness that the body is gone. And by the way, look at this chrysalis in here. Look at this, right? Please explain this. I think it's fantastic. Of course, the soldiers, the Roman soldiers, they completely, you know, they're scared to death and they can go into a paralyzed type of a situation right there. And then they have to be bought off to not tell the truth of what they had witnessed. The soldiers are bought off. So they don't tell the truth of what they have witnessed. And, of course, tell the people, you know, that while we were sleeping, the disciples came and stole the body. And, of course, you know my response to that. That's just the dumbest thing that could ever be said. And if this comes into the governor's ears, we got your back. We'll protect you. I mean, they're going to great lengths to make sure that even the soldiers don't bear witness to the fact that Christ has been raised and in the way that he had been raised and the supernatural element of the angelic that took place. Still in 12, these angels were sitting where the body of Jesus had lain. Now that's an affirmation of the resurrection. It was there, but it's not there anymore. Affirmation of the resurrection. He had lain there. Now watch this. Bottom of 12. One angel was at the head and one at the feet of the slab where the body would have been. Now, I want you to see this for a second. I want you to get this picture. The Ark of the Covenant in the Holy of Holies. The lid on this Ark. Inside the Ark where it was supposed to be at one time uh, a jar of manna that uh, had been placed in there as a memorial. I think it points to Jesus as the bread of life. There was Aaron's rod that budded, and that's, of course, in reference to God's choice through that miracle that he had chosen Aaron, Aaron's line in the Levitical line to minister as a priest, and so it points to Christ's Melchizedekian priesthood of which God had, had chosen. What else was in there? Do you remember? What was the third thing that was in there? Tablets. There was the tablets of the law. Christ is the word. John 1.1. 1, 1. In the beginning was the word. The word was with God and God was the word. Jesus is the word. This lid that was on top. There were two angels on top of this lid. One at one end and one at the other end. See, it never stops coming at you if you just take time to look at it. You've got a picture here of what was always portrayed in the top of the Ark of the Covenant. And now these angels, and only Mary is getting to see it. Only Mary. Why is that? Because God chose. God chose her in particular. 
That's all I can say about that. And she gets this revelation. Now, whether she really understood it or not, I don't really know. But here we've got it. And all of a sudden, this thing just explodes that what the, the Israelites had been carrying around throughout the wilderness, wandering, and this guy, this Ark of the Covenant spoke about the resurrection of the one whom it pointed to. And the angel was at one end and the angel at the other end. Verse 13, and they said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? Because you know what? Under the circumstances, the weeping is highly inappropriate. This is joyous. But all she knew, right, in her humanistic frame of mind at this moment, was that she was missing her master. What did they do with the body? And that's all she wants. She just wants the body. She's by herself. Because the other women, now, they had already gone. They had already gone. Jesus had not met them yet on the way back to making that announcement to the rest of the 12. They're called the 12. Uh, even though we know there were only 10 of them at this point. Judas is dead. Thomas is missing. He's, uh, you know, what? He's uh, AOL. No, he's A W. No, he's A Wall. Okay, he's A W L. A W A L. A W O L. O L. O L. Okay, good. Did I tell you how tired I am right now? How goofy I am? Okay. Yeah, well, you're goofy all the time. They said to her, woman, why are you weeping? <laughs> she says to them, they have taken away my Lord. See, even in death, he is still Lord. She's not letting go. She may not understand it all, but she, all she knows is Jesus. All she knows is her Jesus. And even in death, she's not letting go. Would that be the case for all of us? That at the end of our days, at the end, in the very last seconds, before we breathe our last, and the heart pumps for the very last few beats, that we're still not letting go, even in death. And you won't. And you won't. Because if you're in Christ, you're a miracle. You're a miracle. You've been crucified with him, buried with him, raised again unto newness of life. And he says, I will never ever, Hebrews 13, 5, I will never ever leave you, never ever forsake you. And 1 Thessalonians 4, verse 17 and 18, you will always be with him. He establishes in Hebrews 13, 5 that he will never leave you. And now in 1 Thessalonians 4, 17, you will never leave him. Well, they've taken away my Lord and I do not know where they are have laid him. This woman, this witness of the angelic that we've seen, and now Mary. And it moves forward a little bit. By the way, I should probably point out to you 1 Corinthians and the 15th chapter, which when I'm done with the Isaiah papers, we will return to 1 Corinthians and we will jump right into this 15th chapter. Paul's incredible... Um, doctrine of the resurrection of Christ. But I want you to look at something right here. Because we're talking about witnesses to this was a resurrection, right? 1 Corinthians 15, let's start at verse 1. We'll go down through verse 8. Now I would remind you, brothers, of the gospel I preached to you, which you received, in which you stand, and by which you are being saved. I like that they bring out the present tense there. If if, now this is a characteristic of those who are saved, if you hold fast to the word I preach to you. Holding fast to the word, the gospel that he preached to them is a characteristic of the saved, those who are in the process of being saved. Unless, bottom of verse 2, you have believed in vain. In other words, to no avail. Unless you just exercise uh, this mental state of affirming some sort of a belief. But it really wasn't a belief or a faith given to you by God. In which case you're believing in vain. I have met people like this claiming to be Christians. But I'm convinced that they are not. That they are not a product of being birthed from the womb of heaven. First, verse 3. For I delivered to you as of first importance what I also received. Remember Galatians 1.12? Paul says, I was never taught this gospel by any man. I received it by revelation of Christ. So you're getting the revelation direct right here. I delivered to you as of first importance what I also received. That 
Christ died for our sins in accordance with the scriptures. I got to be careful that I don't preach this passage to you because it's just loaded with good stuff. Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures. Four, that he was buried and that he was raised on the third day according, in accordance with the scriptures, which we reviewed last week. Verse five, now watch this. He gives a brief listing of those whom God set apart to witness. Remember, nobody saw Christ come out of the tomb. Nobody saw that. We see the aftermath of it. People are called to witness to the aftermath of it. All right, and now here we go. Verse five, and that he appeared to Cephas. Now that's Aramaic for, for Peter. Uh, he's the stone. He's the little pebble here is what this is. W what is this talking about? He appeared to, to Peter. Do you know of any passage that describes um, the Lord Jesus in his post-resurrection state appearing to Peter? No, there is none. There is none. But there is an interesting hint. Make a note of Luke 24, 34. You don't need to go there. Just make a note. Luke 24 and verse 34. And I will read it quickly to you because the individuals who were on the road to Emmaus after Christ had encountered them, come back to Jerusalem, speak to the 12, and they say something interesting. Luke 24, verse, I'm going to start at 33, and they rose the same hour and returned to Jerusalem, and they found the 11 and those who were with them gathered together, saying, the Lord has risen indeed and has appeared to Simon. That's Simon Peter. So there was a, an appearance to Peter in particular. And then they told them what happened on the road and how he was made known to them in the breaking of bread. But back to 1 Corinthians 15 now, verse 5, he appeared to Cephas, then to the 12. Note that phrase, the 12. Not the disciples, not the apostles. This was a term that was used to describe the 12 in particular, even though there was only 10 of them relative to this, this resurrection scenario. Judas is gone. Thomas is not there with them. That he appeared then in verse 6 to more than 500 brethren at one time, most of whom are still alive, though some have fallen asleep. Those are still alive because you can go talk to them. They will bear witness to what they saw, you see. Verse 7, then he appeared to James, that would be the half-brother of Christ, then to all the apostles. Now that's not including the twelve. There are other apostles. Apostle is, means one who is sent. Now, Barnabas was an apostle, and he was sent by God. Uh, John Mark was an apostle. He was sent by God. There were more than just the 12. And now, interesting verse, verse 8. Paul's speaking now. Last of all, as to one untimely born, he appeared also to me. Uh, eschatas, the Greek there, that is for last. It, last is perfectly fine. It also carries the idea of finality to it. Finally, in Christ's raised, glorified state, the present Christ, see, appeared to Paul, and he is the last one. It's the final appearance. Nobody sees the raised Christ as he appears physically, tangibly in his glorified body past the Apostle Paul. I'm absolutely convinced that that's what that is referring to right there. People say, well, what about John on the island of, uh, of, of Patmos? Jesus had already appeared to John. <laughs> it had taken place before. But you got to read through that first chapter carefully. You will see that this is a vision that John was given. John was not shown. It, the, person, the personhood of the raised Christ is not who appeared to John really at that, at that moment. This is metaphor that is going on right there. So that's another situation altogether. But I wanted you to see that list of witnesses right there, okay? Now, back to John chapter 20. Got to move along here. Got to move along. We're in the second point now. And now the witness of the raised Lord himself. He appears now to Mary looking at verse 14. Having said this, that is, they've taken away my Lord. I don't know where they've laid him. She still thinks that the Jews or maybe Roman soldiers have gone in to the tomb and they've taken the body away. Having said this, verse 14, she turned around and saw Jesus standing. But she did not know that it was Jesus. This is not the only place in the gospel accounts that speak about uh, this encounter with the Lord Jesus and the people who are encountering him, they don't recognize him. 
something's going on here. They don't recognize him. He looks, he's different. Uh, some commentators, I, I don't know about commentators, but okay. Some commentators, they just go, well, you know, the, 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 the mess that his body was in as a result of the crucifixion. Well, it's true that his body retained the scars and the evidence of what he had gone through on, on Calvary's Hill. No question about that. But there's more to it than simply that. For instance, we were, we were, uh, I was making reference earlier to Luke 24, and now I'm going to have you write down Luke 24, verses 13 through 16. Luke 24, verses 13 through 16. Listen to this now. This is interesting. That very day, two of them were going to a village named Emmaus. This is Resurrection Sunday now, the first of the Sabbaths, uh, about seven miles from Jerusalem. And they were talking with each other about all these things that had happened. 15. While they were talking and discussing together, Jesus himself drew near and went with them. But, 24.16 says, their eyes were kept from recognizing him. And he said to them, what is this conversation that you were holding with each other as you talk? And then that continues on. But I want you to focus on verse 16. Their eyes were kept from recognizing him. Kept back. The, uh, the Greek has the idea of holding back. Uh, just that's all there is to it. Kept back from recognizing is a good translation here uh, in the ESV and the New American Standard is also very excellent. So they were not recognizing him. Then they go on you know, their way, and they come to Emmaus. Look down at verse 30 and 31. Verse 30 and 31. They tell him, you know, he acts like he's going to go further. They talk him into staying with him that night, and so he went in to stay with them. Now, verse 30. When he was at table with them eating, he took the bread and blessed and broke it and gave it to them. Now, watch 31. And their eyes were opened. Their eyes were opened. Was there something in the bread? No. It's something that God is doing. He chose to do it during the table. And their eyes were open. Suddenly they knew who he was. And now this is interesting. Jesus doesn't hang around to say, good to see you guys or something like that. Because 31 says, their eyes were open and they recognized him. And what? He vanished from their sight. Now, come on. If you were there, wouldn't that just freak you right out? I mean, so you're talking to him all of a sudden, poof, gone. Whoa. This is the glorified Christ. And all they could say, verse 32, they said to each other, did not our hearts burn within us while he talked to us on the road, while he opened up the scriptures? Isn't that something? Isn't that amazing? That's not the only place where people's eyes were kept, held back from recognizing for whatever reason. Uh, you know, it very well could be that, uh, this is just my opinion, that the Lord Jesus himself in his raised state is... Uh, not recognizable. He's not knowable in the sense of the way they saw him prior to um, the crucifixion and then the attending resurrection that would, that would follow. We are, we are required to dig a little bit deeper to know him a little bit better. Uh, John 21 and verse 4. John 21 and verse 4. Give you another example here. Here's where uh, Peter leads altogether seven of them, including himself, to go back into the fishing business. We'll talk about this. Uh, 21 and verse 4. Just as the day was breaking, as the day was breaking, Jesus stood on the shore. Yet the disciples did not know that it was Jesus. <laughs> Jesus said to them, Children, do you have any fish? They answered him, No. He said to them, cast the net on the right side of the boat. You'll find some. So they cast it. And now they were not able to haul it in because of the quantity of fish. That disciple whom Jesus loved, you know who that is, right, John? Therefore said to Peter, it is the Lord. Interesting, isn't it? How John, who also stayed all the way through the crucifixion, was there with Mother Mary at Golgotha, was faithful gets the insight that it is the Lord. But before, they didn't know it was the Lord. We're, we're, we'll talk in more detail about that when I get to it uh, pretty soon here, all right? So, <laughs> having, verse 14 of chapter 20, having said this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing, but she did not know it was Jesus. 15, Jesus says to her, Woman, why are you weeping? Now, that sounds familiar. Who just said that recently? The yeah, the angels to, to Mary. Now, this is not a derogatory woman. 
you know, kind of a thing. This is a respectful way, a loving way in, in, the, uh, uh, in the Hebraism of the time for, for him to greet her. Woman, why are you weeping? Examine why you are weeping here. Examine. You're weeping out of loss. You're weeping out of unbelief. No. Why are you weeping? And then here, here's Jesus. Whom are you seeking? Not what are you seeking, but whom. In other words, there's somebody that's alive. You're not seeking a thing, a corpse, but a person. Who are you seeking? In your trauma, who do you seek? In your trauma, who do you seek? I don't seek for a dead Christ. I don't seek for a dead philosopher or something like that. I seek for the living Christ Jesus at the right hand of the Father who is here on the earth in the spiritual realm since A.D. 70 and continues to be here and his continu kingdom continues to grow no matter what is going on on the physical planet. Muslim this, Muslim that, like they're taking over the world. Sorry, already been taken over by Christ. They'll never have a hand on this earth. Never had a hand on its people. Whom are you seeking? Supposing him to be the gardener, <laughs> she said to him, Sir, and that's kurios, it's lowercase, so it's sir. If you have carried him away, tell me where you've laid him. I will take him away. I mean, you've got to just love Mary here. I mean, you know, like she is going to be able to carry the dead weight of this man. And I'll just carry him away. It does, all she wants is her master. All she wants is her Jesus. It, nothing is, is too hard for Mary right now. She's got her superwoman cape on. She can do anything. Because all she wants is Jesus. 16. Jesus said to her. Now you talk about. We already saw how that. And the two on the road to Emmaus. They're eating at the table. And during the breaking of bread. Their eyes were open. Right? We already saw you know, in John 21, 4 and following right there, that it is in the miracle of the quantity of the fish, which, which I will point out to you as soon as we get there. John had, had seen before, of course, and recognized that's the king. That's the king providing the fish. We'll talk more about that when we get it. And now here we go. What does Jesus do for Mary? Verse 16, Jesus said to her, Mary, but he says it, obviously, in a way that is pure and perfect and personal. And the way he addresses her, see, this is just such a pure relationship. I really despise these books. And I've got a few of them. I have to have a few of them. That place Jesus and Mary in some sort of a sexual, ridiculous, sinful position. Um, there's a book that was written back in the late 70s, early 80s, late 70s, called Holy Blood and Holy Grail. And it continues to promote the idea that Jesus himself is the actual grail, not a cup, but it's Jesus that is the grail. And there's even pictures in there, supposedly, of people who are in the line, physical line, of Jesus and Mary. Because Jesus and Mary, gets, they get married, see? This whole, th that's complete fantasy, total crock. And it's all meant to do one thing and one thing only. And that is to remove the idea of the risen Savior. Because Jesus, if he, you know, obviously did not die. So I guess that spear up into the pericardium, piercing the heart, that was okay. That was okie dokie. Because you know... That coolness of that tomb, baby, revived him, obviously. I don't have that much faith to believe something like that. Hey, I don't got it. So if you've taken him away, she says, tell me, I'll take him away. Jesus says, Mary, this is the call of revelation. She turned and said to him, now it says in Aramaic, but it's, Ebraistai, the Greek word. Ebraistai, can you hear the word? Can you hear the English word? Ebra, Hebrew. She spoke in Hebrew. Or rather, he said it in Hebrew. Thank you. She turned and said to him in Hebrew, Rabboni. It doesn't mean just rabbi. But the form means my rabbi. My rabbi. My teacher. And of course, which means teacher. But what doesn't come out 
in the Greek is that it's my teacher. Very close, very personal. Jesus said to her, do not cling to me. For I have not yet ascended to the Father, but go to my brothers and say to them, I'm ascending to my Father and to your Father, to my God and your God. Now, this is uh, this first opening statement here at the top of 17, Jesus says to her, do not cling to me. Uh, this has been widely misunderstood. The Greek right here is me mu aptu. Me is the negative, is the negative. So not or do not, that kind of a thing. Mu means me, like as in me. Uh, apto, to cling, to cling. Uh, but the apto here is a present middle imperative. The imperative is you need to stop. I'm ordering you to stop continuously, present tense, continuously clinging to me. You're holding me back is the idea right now. He's not that he's pushing her away or something like that, but something is happening right here. So really the better way to translate this, and maybe Amplified brings this out. I didn't check today. Does anybody have, uh, what does Net say right there, Mary, uh, at, uh, at verse 17 for do not cling? Jesus replied, do not touch me. For I have not yet ascended to my Father. Okay, so the idea of touching, that comes from apto. Apto has the idea of, of a touch that's, and I've shared this with you before, it's like if you took a match and you took a piece of paper and you just got that match just close enough to that paper and it just immediately catches that paper on fire. That's the idea of apto, okay? It's, it's, where, it's where they join, okay? So Jesus says, you, you, meet, you, need to, you need to let me go. You can't go on holding me back. And Mary just read it just now uh, uh, down here where he says, Do not cling to me, for I have not yet ascended to the Father. This is the reason why he says what he says to her. Don't go on clinging to me, holding me back. I have not yet ascended to the Father. So everything here, everything that he is doing from this point on, from the resurrection and then the, for the next 40 days is all designed. I, he's got a schedule he's keeping. There are things that he is going to be doing continuously giving revelation and further teaching to the disciples. Um, he's going to meet with them in, the, in that unnamed mountain in Galilee. There's going to be some teaching times and things like that. And he's on a schedule. So the, the, the goal is for me to ascend right on time to the Father. So he says to her, instead of clinging on to me, right, go to my brothers, middle of 17, and say to them, I am ascending to my father and to your father. Now, now he calls them, now this would be the 10, of course, known in a group setting as the 12, yes? He calls them his brothers. Calls them his brothers. You know why? Because of Romans 8.29. <laughs> Romans 8.29, for those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to become conformed to the image of his son in order that he might be the firstborn among what? Many brothers or many brethren. So now they are brothers because of the finished work of the cross there. Hebrews 2, verses 10 through 13. Hebrews 2, verses 10 through 13. For it was fitting that he, speaking of Christ, for whom and by whom all things exist in bringing many sons to glory. By the way, that links back to the bottom of verse 9 where it says he might taste death for everyone. It's the many sons that he tastes death for in this context. And so you might want to hook that up right there. Bringing many sons to glory. That uh, he should make the founder of their salvation perfect through suffering. For he who sanctifies, that's Christ, and those who are sanctified or, uh, have all one source. Actually, the source is Christ. He who sanctifies is the Father. That is why he is not ashamed to call them what? Brothers, because there is a finished sanctification that takes place. That is also ongoing, by the way. So I just wanted you to see those. Now he speaks to them, back in John chapter 20, about saying to Mary, middle of 17, go to my brothers now. He's affirming the finished work of the cross and the resurrection. Say to them, I'm ascending to my father. Now by a calling him my father, according to John 5.18, according to John 5.18, when Jesus refers to God as his father, he is making himself what? 
equal with God. Very good, very good. John 5.18 is what you want to write down right there. I'm ascending to my Father and your Father, he's your Father now, to my God and your God. There is that sense of submission. He is my God. He is ever submissive to the Father. Remember, I've shown you this once before. Back to 1 Corinthians 15, starting at verse 22. For as in Adam all die, so also in Christ all shall be made alive. Everybody is in Adam, but not everybody is in Christ. So that's limited right away. In Christ all shall be made alive. But each in his own order, Christ the first fruits relative to resurrection, then at his coming or his parousia, those who belong to Christ. That's talking about the resurrection that takes place at the parousia. Then comes the end. Right then is the end. And now he explains what the end is. When he delivers the kingdom to God the Father. See, he submits the kingdom back to the Father. After destroying every rule, every authority and power. Those are spiritual rulers, authorities and powers, not physical. For he must reign until he has put all his enemies under his feet. The last enemy to be destroyed is death. For God has put all things in subjection under his feet. But when it says all things are put in subjection, it is plain that he, God, is accepted who put all things in subjection under him, Christ. When all things are subjected to him, God the Father, then the Son himself, listen to this now, because here's where we're at right now for the last 2,000 years, then the Son himself will also be subjected to him who put all things in subjection under him that God the Father may be all in all. And that's what we've been dealing with for the last 2,000 years. Christ in perfect submission to the Father. And the Father is all in all. Uh, that's why it speaks about in Philippians, the second chapter, that every knee will bow, every tongue will confess Jesus Christ is Lord. To who? Yeah, to the glory of God the Father. See, now he is the one who is to be magnified through Christ. Back to John chapter 20. Say to them, I'm ascending to my Father and your Father, to my God and your God. 18, Mary Magdalene went and announced to the disciple. This is her second trip now. Note the difference. Look back at verse 2, chapter 20 of John and verse 2. Note the difference. So she ran and went to Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one whom Jesus loved, said to them, They have taken the Lord out of the tomb. We do not know where they've laid him. She's panicked. She's panicked. But now she has encountered her Jesus. And all that panic is gone. Now she is the emissary that brings this good news to these men. Mary Magdalene, verse 18, Mary Magdalene went and announced to the disciples, I have seen the Lord. Look at the difference. What a difference. I have seen the Lord. He's alive. And that he had said these things to her. That's the witness of the raised Lord. So we've seen the witness of the angelic and Mary herself. The witness of the raised Lord. Thirdly then, we come to the witness of the ten and a special revelation. This starts now, brings us to verse 19. Verse 19. Verse 19, John chapter 20. We're almost done. On the evening of that day, here we go again, the first day of the week. Eh, that's wrong. <laughs> yeah, it's Mia. It's Te Mia Sabaton. The first of the Sabbaths. The word day, see where it says the first day of the week? Now, it says on the evening of that day. Now, that word for day is in the Greek text. And then the first day of the week, the second usage of day, emera, not in the Greek text. Not in the Greek. So you can just scratch that out. It's the first of the Sabbaths. So it, once again, that is reintroduced and repressed to us that this is important, that Christ was raised on the first of all the Sabbaths to come. Hebrews 4.9, there remains a Sabbath keeping for the people of God because of the resurrection of Christ. That's why we call it the Sabbath. We are to call Sunday the Sabbath and we are to truly rest. That's what remains for the people of God. When you blow that off and you refer to church on Sunday, I know you're not doing it intentionally, you know, we're just talking. But really the affirmation should be it's church on Sabbath. Let the world say, oh, well, that's Saturday. Well, they don't understand. No, it's Sunday, the Sabbath. And so we've got to be careful because we end up denying the resurrection when we refer to it as a, any kind of a day except the Sabbath. And that carries plenty of fulfillment weight along with it. 
So on the first of the Sabbath, verse 19, the doors being locked, darn straight, where the disciples were, for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood among them and said to them, Peace be with you. Man, you bet those doors are locked. You better believe it, man. Nobody's going to get to us. They figure, man, they got Jesus. They're going to come after us too. We're next. They're sure they're going to get their followers. They're expecting any time, you know, for Rome to be sending a contingency of soldiers. Worse yet would be these high priests and their soldiers that were assigned to them by Rome and coming and knocking down the doors. And of course, you know, when it says here the, the, the doors were locked where the disciples were for fear of the Jews. Because of the resurrection and then the coming of the Holy Spirit on the day of, of Pentecost, that's all going to change. That's what This whole fear thing going to go right away, going to vanish. Uh, check out Acts 4, verse 13. Acts 4 and verse 13. Check it out or just write it down. <laughs> uh, Peter and John had been preaching away here, but now what's going to happen? Now, he, they just got in front of the Sanhedrin, and the Sanhedrin is telling them, or is going to tell them, you're not going to keep preaching or anything. Peter just got through saying in verse 12, there's salvation in no one else, and there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. Now when they saw the boldness of Peter and John, the boldness of these men, and perceived that they were uneducated common men, they didn't go to seminary or anything like that, they were astonished and they recognized that they had been with Jesus. See, now I've got to put that on myself. Do people recognize that I'm with the Lord? Do they recognize that I've been with Jesus? Does Christ's presence and the, the scent and the power and the knowledge come through me? Do, pe do other people see Jesus in me? Do they recognize that I've been with Jesus? Do they recognize that you've been with Jesus? Because you know that's coming next, right? I'm going to say that. They recognize they had been with Jesus. Look down at verse 19 and 20. Same, same chapter, verse 19 and 20. After they got through telling them to not speak anymore in the name of Jesus, verse 19. But Peter and John answered them, whether it is right in the sight of God to listen to you rather than to God, you must judge. Verse 20, for we cannot but speak of what we have seen and heard. When they further threatened them, let them, let them go, finding no way to punish them because of the people. For all were praising God for what had happened. They had just uh, seen the man healed through Christ's faith that he had given the man at the gate beautiful in the third chapter. This all carries over in the fourth chapter. Now 422. For the man on whom this sign of healing was performed was more than 40 years old. Everybody knew who he was. Everybody saw him over an entire generation. Back to John chapter 20. <laughs> so that whole thing of being afraid of the Jews, this is going away. Middle of verse 19. Jesus came and stood among them and said to them, Peace be with you. Peace be with you. Now that doesn't, that's not just simply shalom, everybody, everybody be peaceful or something like that. This is an announcement of the successful work of the cross and the resurrection. Because, you know, when Jesus talks about this peace, it's not some light little Philly peace or something like that. This is the peace of God that passes all understanding because of justification. This is Romans 5, 1 peace. Being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. That peace be with you. Verse 20. And when he had said this, he showed them his hands and his side. And then the disciples were glad when they saw the Lord. Just write down Luke 24, verse 36 through 43 right there. Luke 24, verse 36 through 43. And that gives you the whole panorama there out of Luke's gospel where Jesus appears and they go, ah, it's a ghost, right? They think it's a spirit. And Jesus has to say to them, yeah, stop, you know, touch me, feel me. A ghost, a spirit does not have flesh and bone as you see I have. You got anything to eat? And they give him some boiled fish, you know, and he's eating it and they're just freaking out. The disciples were glad when they saw the Lord. Verse 21, Jesus said to Again, second time he says this, peace be with you. There's that doubling idea again. When, when revelation is doubled, it's absolutely affirming the fact of what is being 
promoted right there. This piece, this is Romans 5.1 piece, announcing the successful work on the cross and the resurrection. Peace be with you. Now watch. as the, He gets right down to business because he, that's why he says to Mary, don't go on clinging to me. Don't keep holding on to me because I'm on a schedule here. I'm running a schedule. And so i got to go be with the boys. As the Father has sent me, so I am sending you. Now he already talked. He already talked to the Father about this in his high priestly prayer of John 17 and verse 18 that he is sending them forth. Now he's not going to just send them forth with "Go ahead on your way" and start preaching. He's going to empower them with something. And I'm really disappointed in other commentaries and and uh, John MacArthur's commentary in this. I'm very disappointed with because he just sees this as just sort of a foretaste of the day of Pentecost. No, this is not that. This is more than that. Jesus. Is is not giving some foretaste or some metaphor or some example of the power that they're going to have as a result of the Holy Spirit coming. You know, Now John chapter 7 says the Holy Spirit doesn't come until Jesus is glorified. Well Jesus has been glorified and the Holy Spirit is coming now upon these guys. Now watch, I'm going to prove it to you. Verse 22, in order to send them they're going to need something. 22, and when he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven them. If you withhold forgiveness from any, it is withheld. Now watch this, 22. And when he had said this, he breathed on them. In order for them to be sent, they need this power. Now he breathed on them. I've got written down Genesis 2 and verse 7 right there. Genesis 2 and verse 7. That's where Christ has just formed man of the dust of the ground. He has squeezed him into shape, the Hebrew says. And you've got this body here. And then Elohim, the plurality for God, it's pointing towards the Trinity. Elohim breathes into Adam and he became a living soul. Jesus now does it again. Only this time he breathes into the deadness of the life of these guys who weren't believing that Jesus was going to be raised. They're afraid. And now he breathes into them something very specific. What, what does he say? This is resulting in this breathing on them. It says, he said to them, receive the Holy Spirit. Now the word, Greek word there for receive, you know I'm going there with this. The Greek there for receive is labate. Labate, it's a plural. All of you receive. Now it's aorist. It's active. Eris just means that it's undefined, okay? The context tells you how to define the word that, the verb that is in the aorist tense. The, 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 uh, the voice is active, but the mood is imperative. So he is commanding them now. This is not a foretaste. This is not something that's po being to pointed towards in regards to Pentecost. No, this is happening right then. Imperative, imperative mood right there. Very important. Receive, I command you, the Holy Spirit. Did they receive the Holy Spirit right then or not? Well, sure. You can't. La bate is very strong. Imperative mood right there. Receive the Holy Spirit. And then he says why. Why was the Holy Spirit given to them at this point and for what purpose? Now, he just said, I'm sending you forth. As the Father has sent me, so I am sending you. But there is something that's going on here. When you preach the gospel and men and women believe on the gospel or reject the gospel, there is the power to forgive sins or to announce the forgiving of sins because only God can forgive sins. But there is the empowerment to announce through the person of the Holy Spirit who is inside of these, these men. And that announcement of forgiveness of sins when somebody believes carries with it that power and that assurance, once again, that assurance that forgiveness has taken place. That's the purpose. That is not the purpose. That is the purpose of them receiving the Holy Spirit in this way. So he says, if you forgive, aphemai, perfect tense, absolute forgiveness, the sins of any, then guess what? They are, in fact, forgiven. Now, what about those who don't believe? What about those who reject the gospel? What about them? But if you withhold forgiveness, krateo, 
It's the Greek word behind hold. It's a present tense form of the verb. If you continue to hold forgiveness from any, it is krateo, again, but this time perfect tense, it is withheld. It is perfectly, completely held back. They do not receive forgiveness because if, if they're rejecting it, they don't get the assurance obviously, of that forgiveness. But if they receive the gospel, believing on it because the Lord Jesus gives his faith to them, they get something else. They get the apostles who are now filled with the Holy Spirit for this very purpose to know that they have the assurance of everlasting life. Think of in terms of uh, Jesus' with the thief on the cross. What do you say to him? as a result of believing on, on Christ, on, on, they're dying. He says, this day you will be with me, what? In paradise. There's that assurance that's coming. This is similar to that. Jesus could give it, filled with the Holy Spirit. But these guys needed this right here. And guess who, guess who didn't get it? Thomas was missing. Thomas was AWOL. Thanks for straightening that out, by the way. <laughs> Thomas was AWOL. We'll deal with him next week. I think he gets a little bit of a bad rap, but here he should have been there. And by the way, I don't mind saying to you that uh, the assumption, and we assume nothing here at Messiah. If it's not in the text, we're not assuming anything. There's no place in the text that says Thomas got this. I'm sorry. It's just not there. You say, wow, that's kind of harsh. No, that's... He was supposed to be where he was supposed to be, and he didn't get it. This is what drives me in, into a grief mode, you know. Look at all the people in our church who are not here tonight. They're not where they're supposed to be. Now, I know circumstances take place. You know I know that. But then what about people who just made a habit out of it, right? And they're not receiving from the Lord because they're not where they're supposed to be. Where's the hunger? Where's the thirst for righteousness? Where's 1 Peter 2, 1 and 2? Where is that? Hungering like newborn babes for the sincere milk of the word that we might grow. Got our sister right here. She's not even a member of Messiah. She's here every Wednesday night. Larry sacrifices to make sure that he gets her here. Same thing for Jim. You want to be here? You'll be here. You'll find a way. Hungering and thirsting for righteousness, you'll be filled. Where's the evidence of the miracle of your regeneration? It's the hunger. The number one evidence is the hunger for the word. Where was Thomas? We're going to see him say next week, unless I put my fingers in his hands and I thrust my hand at his side, I will not, not, it's a double negative, I will not, not believe. Wow. We'll talk about why he was that way. Thomas is not a lost case. I don't think we should be calling him Doubting Thomas. I don't think that's right. The witnesses to a raised Redeemer. Man, we're seeing it tonight. We're almost done with this 20th chapter. And then there'll be the, finally the 21st chapter. Very powerful. And then we will be back into the Minor Prophets. Lord, thank you so much for how you have opened up the Word just like you did, Lord, to those men on the road to Emmaus how you had to open their, high, their eyes so that they might understand. And, oh, God, we recognize that along with those men, we want our hearts to burn within as you open up the scriptures to us. Forevermore, Lord, your word is settled in heaven. Settle it in our hearts in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. I thank you and praise you tonight, Lord. Let your blessing be made rich upon my brothers and sisters who are here. To those who are watching on YouTube, bless them, Lord, with the power of your word, the sureness of the things that we have studied tonight. Let faith come. Let it grow. Let the knowledge of the Lord grow inside of us. Produce your fruits in us, Lord God. And let your kingdom continue to expand and grow and bring whom you will unto your son father now take my brothers and sisters bless them and keep them make your face to shine upon them and be gracious unto them lift up your countenance upon them and give them peace in the name of the lord jesus christ amen